Okay, great. Well, lovely to see you all here. And um, I think what I'll do is I'll just talk about science and how that has been impacted, not just by Brexit, but also the Brexiteers and their uh, mentality uh, towards UK science. And I'll just keep it focused on that so that we can make a tidy enough package of it because there is ample there. And then I'm more than happy to just then spend the rest of the time um, chatting back and forth with any questions you guys have got about um, all the different campaigning initiatives that are out there. Where do we go from here? What, what I'm, uh, how does this all interact with the current situation in Ukraine? Um, and um, I mean, there, there have been some questions that were sent through to me before, which I've, I've uh, grabbed and lodged in the back cogs of my brain to, to chew upon, some of them easier than others. Um, but I will endeavor to answer all of those and, and anything else uh, any of you would like to throw at me. So <clears throat> to, to then uh, launch into uh, UK science um, and take a sort of chronological approach to it all, I think is easiest uh, for everyone to get a grip on what's happened here. It's, it, storytelling is always the easiest way to approach things. And so going in chronological order helps make a nice story of it. Uh, essentially back in 2015, um, British science was doing really well, uh, really punching above our weight. Um, but we were at the bottom of the G8 for funding per GDP. And this was something that was exercising a lot of the science community, and particularly those in science policy, that um, we could not get uh, the Conservative Party or Labour Party or Liberal Democrats or anyone to take science funding seriously. And in the 2015 election, I, was, I wrote the policy for Scientists for Labour and uh, the science um, shadow science minister for Labour at the time was Liam Byrne. And he was very um, uh, disinterested in what we had to do. So, um, and what we were proposing and it was all, yeah, yeah, whatever. So then when David uh, Cameron actually won in 2015, um, a lot of people within Scientists for Labour were quite distressed and saying, you know, what do we do now? And I said, well, there's nothing we can do for Labour for quite a while. However, coming up really quickly, is going to be a referendum on EU uh, membership because that was part of David Cameron's manifesto. So as the day he won, we were having this discussion within Scientists for Labour and I said, what we need now is to get stuck right into that referendum um, from the science perspective. We don't need politicians to listen to us because we can do our own campaign now directly with the public. That's what all these different sectors will do so we should just jump in there and start a campaign. We should, we should go big on social media with it. And let's call it Scientists for EU, because that's what we'd be about. And um, <clears throat> some of them undenied, but um, a, a colleague, Rob Davidson, said, I think that's a great idea, Mike. Um, you'd better sort out a logo because I've just set up the Facebook page and I've started inviting friends. And we went from there on that Friday right through the weekend. We didn't know at that stage what the science community thought of EU membership. We knew within our own policy heavy group um, that we all thought that would be a bad idea. And, you know, we'd had conversations about Eurosceptic Tories and UKIP before. But when we actually launched on Facebook and Twitter, um, it was like a, a watershed moment where lots of scientists got very excited by saying, Thank, look at the name of this, you know, thank God someone's speaking up because no one had been speaking up in a sort of pro-European way explicitly. You had Nick Clegg, but he was kind of like a lone voice. Everyone else was very measured about what the EU was about, whereas we were saying collaboration, it's great, it's added value, this is brilliant. Um, <clears throat> And so we had a gush of support uh, from the science community that really grew us there. And it was noticed by the press. And so we got invited to write uh, for the Times and, and bring in some big guns. 
And it pretty quickly emerged that about 90% of the science community was for Remain. Um, that came out from some polling that the campaign for um, uh, science and engineering uh, ran. Um, and it was quite clear that the vast majority of the science community thought that it was a massive plus for UK science. So our community was full in. And it was, it was kind of the same for the, for the tech uh, community as well. They were very overwhelmingly um, for. And so Scientists for EU became a major campaign in that referendum and we worked closely, uh, as closely as we could with the Britain Stronger New Europe campaign, which was terrible, and also with European movement, um, which had to back off at the time because it had been associated with federalism and it had taken money from the commission. Um, but it became very clear very quickly that the science community was overwhelmingly for. And we had, for example, um, uh, lots of uh, letters go in, including uh, one signed by, um, not penned by us, penned by a group from Cambridge, from um, Stephen Hawking, may the universe rest his soul, uh, regarded at the time as the brightest man on the planet, said Brexit would be a disaster for science. That was his um, uh, 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 prophecy. And, um, but we, found it very, very hard to get cut through, um, partly because the dominant voices on media were the politicians, um, uh, white male aging politicians for Brexit, white aging male politicians against Brexit, almost all of them from the Conservative Party. And there was very, very little sector by sector or region by region uh, representation, which is something that drove me um, mad and I kept uh, pestering the official Remain campaign about it and they kept sort of saying yeah yeah well you do your thing but just push it with our message. So um, <clears throat> so we got a limited amount of, of cut through because we were also largely positioned as oh these are people receiving grants so of course they want to keep getting more money but these people were making the same arguments that if we leave the EU we'll still have the same amount of money for science. So it, it wasn't adding up, but the, it was clear where the science community was. Then the Brexit vote came, um, and there was a big question of um, a what damage had been done, what was what damage was likely to do. Where do you go from here? Fortunately, I didn't have to um, prostrate myself and say uh, yes. I I. I I bow to the result, I accept the result, I respect the result and all of that. I could just say, well, whatever the result, my interest is in science and how best to develop things from here. Um, <clears throat> I had written before the referendum two plans, one for if we voted remain and one for if we voted leave. One of those plans was exciting and ambitious. The other one was a disaster management manual. Um, I had to employ the latter. The former one had been that um, we would have actually ha held the presidency of the EU in 2017 if we'd voted Remain. Um, and we were very up on science and data and could have taken over from the Dutch that had really been championing all of that. And there were tons of exciting opportunities about rebuilding our place uh, within those systems. But had to go with the disaster manual, which was, first of all, map the damage caused by Brexit. Second of all, uh, make propositions about how we can stay uh, as close as possible to the system with minimum damage going forward. So what we did immediately after the vote was we started collecting stories of, of damage that were done immediately on leaving. And there were lots of them. Um, because of the fallen pound, lots of people's budgets on their projects uh, were blown because they were intending to buy equipment further down the line and the pound had less value. For similar reasons in industries, there was lots of job freezes and um, uh, contract freezes um, and caution about budgets. There were some people that had been lined up to come to UK universities that, that cancelled it immediately um, as the Brexit vote came in. There were tons of people that said they were going to leave the UK, but of course that was more of a, a declared ambition rather than something they acted on. Um, apart from one or two who'd had offers and decided to take it up because that was then on the cards for them. And there was lots of disruption <clears throat> with um, EU 
science project proposals that were in train where it was not understood if um, the UK was going to stay on Horizon 2020 as it was. And so proposals uh, for grants going in were getting reshaped so that other countries would be the leading partner in order to de-risk it. And we all had to move in quite quickly to make sure the government said, no, it won't be for years that we would leave if we did, but we don't intend to leave the science programme. And that did uh, something to calm nerves. But as I'll tell you in a bit, um, <clears throat> It, it didn't really, and there was, there was huge drop off. So there was all of that <clears throat> initial um, chaos to deal with. Um, as one person quoted in the BBC uh, said, overnight, the UK went from being cool in science to being not cool. Um, and there was lots of confusion about what happened from here. But damage started to be done um, from from the vote immediately for all those reasons that I just told you. Now, it was the ambition of Theresa May from, from an early stage in order to have, um, <clears throat> um, to buy in to EU science, at least until the end of Horizon 2020. However, because she was having her feet held to the fire about uh, no deal is better than a bad deal, and because she had Brexit secretaries like David Davis and uh, then Dominic Rubb, uh, they like to flex a lot by saying um, we could walk away at any stage and there'd be no deal. And we did analysis of what no deal would actually mean. And it meant that the UK would lose about half of the funding lines that it was entitled to from Horizon 2020. We could buy into half as an outside country by poning up our own money, uh, but for, for whole streams of them, like the European Research Council grants, the Mary Curie grants, or even coordination of projects, we'd be immediately cut out. Our government denied that on coordination of projects, we'd be cut out. That was a disagreement uh, with the commission, and that was something that was never resolved, but, that constant threat of us crashing out uh, was enough to continually um, <clears throat> spook the dynamics for applications. And what that meant, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> at the end of the day, now oh, it's getting worse. Let me just have a, <clears throat> is that better? A bit. And what that meant at the end of the day, because I did these analyses in 2021, was that the UK declined in participation from joint first place with Germany to uh, fifth place just above the Netherlands. So the UK and Germany had been the two countries that were winning the most on the Horizon 2020 program and also the FP7 program before it. It was always Germany, UK, UK, Germany, 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 UK, Germany, you know, those two far ahead of the others. In 2016, <clears throat> neck and neck. In 2017, the UK fell behind Germany significantly. In 2018, the UK was behind Germany and France. In 2019, the UK was behind Germany, France and Spain. And in 2020, the UK was behind Germany, France, Spain and Italy in fifth place, just above the Netherlands. Um, and in that final year, it was about 30% short of what it should have been and the total amount um, that it had lost out on relative to Germany was 1.5 billion quid and many many thousands of collaborative projects and that's a that's a that's a big hit so even though we were full members of the program nevertheless um, because of that constant uncertainty it knocked us from joint pole position down to fifth position. And that's how we started. That's, that's a position from which we started this new science program called Horizon Europe, which I'll come on to later. But of course, um, it wasn't just that initial impact um, uh, across the board in terms of our um, uh, science power. And it wasn't just our participation on Horizon 2020. Um, 
there's also roles that we had in, for example, the rare disease networks, which have dropped off. Uh, Eurotom has dropped off. Data sharing is, is hanging by a thread. Uh, replacement of regional funds. As we now know, uh, regional funds had done a lot of work in places such as Northern Ireland or, or Cornwall um, or different places in, for example, the north of England and Wales, um, where because these regions were struggling, they had had from the European Commission pot investment into those regions. And increasingly, as we were getting towards um, the, the late 20 teens, that investment was going into um, a technology and science and capacity infrastructure, which relates to all of that. And that was pulled. And as you will see from recent funding offered up by the government for leveling up, it is usually a fraction of what was being offered via the EU and obviously a lot less stable because it's short term funding rather than these big long term uh, programs. On top of that, we lost our role in the European Investment Bank, and that is vast sums of money that, again, could be lent for all kinds of projects. And, and it was including being lent into a lot of hospitals and their infrastructure and research they wanted to do. Then let us not forget the loss of the European Medicines Agency. Now, I will correct something that Boris Johnson has been trying to say in a sec. But let me tell you this, that um, in 2015 and 2016, we were part of the single market for medicines because we were part of the single market overall. And that means in the global marketplace, the biggest market was the US market, um, just because they consume more, even though their numbers are less. The second largest uh, was the European market which means that for new drugs, um, they would go to the biggest markets first, the American market and the, um, and the EU single market. Whereas for example, drugs would get to Switzerland or Canada usually six months later. And this is important for you know, experimental drugs coming on for uh, cancers and for um, deadly rare diseases and things like that. Now, the body that, that oversees approvals for that market was the EU, uh, the European Medicines Agency, and that was housed in London. And that had a staff of nearly a thousand people. It had a turnover, a taxable turnover um, of over 300 million per annum. And it brought in um, many um, thousands of business visits per annum from uh, pharma companies and, and medical device companies and it caused for a whole host of industry to be set up around it. And it strengthened our own MHRA, which is our own national uh, medical and, and healthcare um, devices as well, approval agency. And so we had that twin engine going around that. Now, when we voted for Brexit, we lost uh, the hosting of the European Medicines Agency. So lost that expertise, lost that revenue, lost all of that traffic of people coming in um, and lost all of those connections. And that all went off to Amsterdam. David Davis at the time said we would be able to keep it. He was wrong. Um, and so that was quite a substantial loss on our prowess. Now, uh, when it came to, for example, the rollout of the vaccines, um, then Boris Johnson has been saying, ah, um, the Labour Party wanted to stay in the European Medicines Agency. Thank God we left so that we could have such a fast rollout. Um, what actually happened is you can't really be in the European Medicines Agency. He meant in the single market for medicines, um, of which the European Medicines Agency was the approval body, but we were actually in that at the time. We were fully in that at the time. It's not like we could have we could have been just as fast were we in it. We were actually technically in all of that at the time that we had our fast national approvals and approvals can happen at the national level because you also had Hungary doing approvals for, for Russian vaccines uh, at the same time. So 
we also um, had, and, and I think both the MHRA and the um, European Medicines Agency suffered because of that split. I think the European Medicines Agency, because it recently been pulled over to Amsterdam, was probably quite delayed and disconnected because it couldn't talk to the British partners it was usually working with. And the MHRA, which had been powering the European Medicines Agency, did do a fantastic job on those approvals. But then guess what? Their staff got cut by 25% by this government. After this government had praised them on the vaccines rollout, it cut their staff by 25%, a complete butchery. Why? Because of our new market positioning, we didn't have to do as many approvals um, as we did before, because now we were just a national approvals agency, not a pan-European one. So we just disempowered the MHRA, which is absolutely frustrating as hell. Um, and other cuts also came in, and this is moving from just the effects of Brexit to the effects of Brexit and Brexiteers, because our government at round about the same time decided to pull us out um, or, or reduce our overseas development budget. Um, and it, it cut the rate that we were paying. And this meant, because a lot of the overseas development budget actually goes on collaborative programs around health and science and research. This meant that we had tons of ongoing contracts with British collaborations and science around the world that were instantly frozen and cut overnight, including one in Brazil, which was about new variants in COVID. And that got ended overnight. How ridiculous in the middle of a pandemic to actually cut those contracts. So, so much for global Britain and global science. We also had the government um, say that we're interested in the best and the brightest around the world. And so decided that they would have a special instant rapid visa program for any winners of Nobel prizes or maths prizes, or women in science prizes and so forth and so on. About nine months later, the new scientists inquired how many of these award-winning scientists and, and technical people from around the world have picked up the UK on this, you know, global best and brightest scheme? Answer, zero, absolutely zero. Because this government does not understand what is attractiveness in science. And a stable relationship with the biggest science engine on earth, which is the collective hub that is the EU, is important because people want to be able to go to a country where they can actually lead multinational science programs and get the red hot grants, not go to a country where all of that is unstable. You have scientists leaving and you've got the government cutting the staff at the EMA and cutting contracts um, around the world because it's slashing its budgets in that area. Absolutely nuts. And at the same time, and this is more um, Brexiteer thinking, part of the, the, the science proposal for the future was Dominic Cummings's ARIA, his Advanced uh, Research and Innovation, whatever it's called, I can't even remember the name now, but basically a big slush kitty of funds that is meant to be dumped into, you know, high, high venture exciting science, copying the US model of the 1970s. Uh, to which most people in science policy say, uh, pardon my language here, but no shit, Sherlock. Of course you want to invest in exciting, cutting-edge science. The question is, how do you do it? We have actually got research on research, the science of science, about where money is more productive, about how you can engage younger and more energised people in that, what you probably shouldn't be doing is having a big slush fund where you pick a few buddies that you think have got good antennae for it and they give it out to their pals, especially with um, this being off the radar for freedom of information inquiries, which is what was planned. So you've actually got a big chunk of money that is going to be doled out 
possibly even taken from where it would sit with UK research and innovation funds and actually going to be given out in more experimental ways, maybe to companies that are friendly with the government or something like that. It's not a good look. You know, it's been tried before by government saying, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we um, threw money here and there backing people that we liked? It, it really, um, it was poorly constructed. And even Boris Johnson's brother, uh, Joe Johnson, who had been the science minister before, called it out for being silly and called it out for being a slush fund that sits on the side of UKRI after we had just spent half a decade pulling together the different disparate research councils into one body so that you've got a one-stop shop for analyzing where funding goes more effectively. And we've broken that model by saying, yeah, we're just gonna have another fund on the side that doesn't respect that because it's good to fund from more than one body. It absolutely completely mixed the messaging. And the only reason that happened is not because the Tories were passionate about science, it's because it was, a, it was a freebie for Dominic Cummings. This is something Dominic Cummings has always been interested in. After the referendum debate, um, after, after you know, we had lost, I went for a coffee with Dominic Cummings and sat down with him and, and he you know, came up on his bike and we were having coffee and he said excitedly to me, you know what we really need now? We need a citizen's DARPA. So a, like, like the American DARPA, but this would fund citizen science initiatives. That's how we'd been thinking about it originally. And so then when I saw it on the Conservative Manifesto of 2019, this plan for, for, a, for a UK DARPA and ARPA, I thought, right, the whole Conservative Manifesto here has not been checked with the science community about where wise money spend should be. It's just the bit that was written by Dominic Cummings. With, with a substantial amount of money thrown into a pet project. So what you can see here, um, and, and then I've, I've got some notes here. I made some notes before. You also have, uh, for example, your losses from the research and innovation industry, um, such as Tesla and Intel saying they were going to set up in the EU locations rather than UK locations, uh, citing Brexit. You also, of course, have your general damage from free movement on what that means for working scientists and that making them a lot more uh, reluctant, not only to work in the UK, this is hard to measure though, uh, but also it's harder for you to have conferences in the UK if, for example, scientists are trying to come over on just, you know, European identity cards or something. It makes Europe much more the default place for data handling, coordination of projects, uh, hosting events and so forth and so on. Now, um, uh, Scotland has got to grips with the damage that is um, being done uh, and, and losses at universities. In fact, Scotland's got saltire grants uh, to combat, um, you know, the 41% foreign student losses that you've seen um, in the UK. Uh, and they're fully aware of the damage that Erasmus will do as well. Um, so they are trying to buffer against that but England um, is not and so what you have here is you have Brexit doing damage per se but the Brexiteer disconnect from the science community meaning that they don't actually understand what are the good moves to make in order to make British science strong on its own soil on its own terms but also more attractive to the, to the talent that exists around the world. So you've got that double blow like that, Brexit itself, and then the Brexiteer attitude, just being at a complete disconnect uh, from the best thinking within the science community. Dominic Cummings as well, you know, for all that he loves science, he hasn't been talking to the research on research uh, people, the research policy people. Um, and you also see this in um, the supposed opportunities of Brexit in science, whereas there's this analysis um, by from the Tigger report. So this is the report into um, uh, research and innovation and regulation um, headed up by Ian Duncan Smith and George Freeman, where they were saying we've got new liberties 
and freedom around regulation in science. And most of that is actually not going to come to much because the biggest thing that you want in science is actually being on the same page as most other people in your market so that you can lead big projects on that um, and not have awkward friction and boundaries there. Um, so all of those proposals as to where we can get ahead of the EU and some of these regulatory areas just actually go and cause headaches for a lot of people trying to develop new, to new technologies, um, are worrying about uh, where those approvals are going to happen, where that data sharing can happen, and, and so forth and so on. Right, so um, what does this mean for where we are now and how we go uh, with regards to the future. There's another story here, which is of course the Northern Ireland Protocol. And because the Northern Ireland Protocol has not been sorted, it means that even though in the trade agreement that we have with the EU, we, we had a side agreement to continue as full associate members in the EU science program, the new one being Horizon Europe. Nevertheless, that hasn't been fully signed off and money hasn't been released yet for that program, which started in 2020 and goes until, when does it go until? 2026? Anyway, uh, uh, something like that. But it started last year. Now, it's not so much of a big problem that we weren't involved last year, even though we're on the books for it, because in the first year of all of these programs, the grant levels are very small. It, it's a wind up thing. But now we're into the year 2022. This is a little bit serious um, because we still are not fully part of this program, which is really taking off. There are some projects on which UK institutions have been members um, for specific reasons that I won't go into and the government has had to fill in the funds on our side in order to keep that going but we've also had um, threats from previously David Frost saying if we don't get signed up on the science program soon we're going to pull the plug on our contribution to that and make our own version on the side which of course you can't do because how do you have a multinational science program funded by one nation unless your government is going to fund the labs of all these other nations the only alternative is to get all the other nations to buy in but that takes a long time to set up a program which is just a reinvention of the eu program so that's not going to happen so it's a complete mess and it's a complete pickle um, and we're still out of that and it means that there are lots of institutions and scientists in the UK missing out on the EU science program now. And I remind you that even if this went flawlessly, we would have started from fifth place. Um, so it's looking very frustrating and very dire. And the reason why um, the EU science community and the UK science community and myself are not making a big fuss about the losses happening and what's going on is because we don't want to give sucker to Brexiteers like Bill Cash and David Frost and pushing on George Freeman to say, oh, we haven't sorted this Irish protocol thing. We've missed out on the, the, the EU science program too much. Too much money is wasted. We're just gonna have our own program. But this, this horrible corrosion of our partnerships where we absolutely used to lead Europe in science, that is ongoing as we speak and will not be resolved until the Northern Irish Protocol is resolved. And we know that Boris Johnson at the moment is so weak that he can easily be pushed around by the ERG, who are very keen on blowing up the Northern Ireland Protocol. So we're in a very dangerous place there for our participation in EU science, for our participation also in um, uh, Copernicus. We've lost Galileo. Copernicus uh, is, is another one uh, that is vulnerable because of that. And that is the um, Earth mapping system that is so vital in mapping floods and helping us map impacts of climate change and, and, and change the land. You know, we're, we're losing out there. Um, 
we've been cut out of, of, of Galileo and so have desperately tried to replace it by buying into this one web system, which now can't launch because it standardly launches from Russian launch pads and that's now been frozen. And also our role in Euroton um, and the international um, uh, nuclear fusion apparatus of, of ITER in South France is also in jeopardy because when we were in the EU, we were part of that through the EU. When we did Brexit, we didn't join it as a separate nation because it's got its own vastly complicated economic dynamic of contributions. In fact, it's got its own currency, or at least it did have before. It was that complicated because it gets buy-in from around the world, from um, uh, South Korea, from the States, from everywhere. So we joined back into um, ETA through our Euratom contracts as a sort of shadow member of the EU. And that is also hanging and floating. So we are in a very screwed position um, with um, British science and its place in uh, the EU science hub and then where we would be if we couldn't stay on with that European science hub. We, we would be really, really kicked out to the side, just getting scraps off the table. And that's the, um, that's the best explanation I can give um, of where we are from right the way from, you know, um, when the referendum started to where we are now, um, not actually knowing if we're going to continue on the EU science program and with Copernicus and with ETA and also with um, Erasmus Plus gone, um, which really damages um, our universities hugely in partnerships of the future. And also with free movement and uh, recognition of qualifications between countries, meaning that that fluidity of scientists between the UK and Europe um, is damaged and our reputation in the world is also limited because people see that we're not running the massive hub of EU science as we were before. So that's that's where we are now and um, and it makes me sad. End. <laughs> Questions? <laughs>